All right. Um, Oops. Sorry. There we go. Okay, so uh, quite, Jamie, are you recording this now? Yes, she okay. is. Great. Um, so this is going to be a, a critique of pharmacogenomic testing for, uh, for the selection of psychotropic medications. Um, as clinicians in practice are aware, and as the question itself today brought up, there's really no shortage of people out there who are promoting the possible benefits and making claims of, of utility for these uh, gene testing products. So I'm not going to really belabor the, 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 the claims of benefit. Uh, rather, what I find is in these claims, there's uh, not a whole lot of considered um, attention to the weaknesses of the science. And so I'm going to focus uh, my talk on the, the limitations of our knowledge and, and the weaknesses of, of the current, the current uh, product as I understand it. Uh, I think a key thing to, to know from the beginning is that there's a, there's a very substantial difference between FDA regulations as relate to drug promotion and FDA regulations as relate to the promotion of lab test products. Um, if I'm a drug company and I want to say that this drug will treat depression, um, that statement has to be backed up by multiple large-scale randomized clinical studies that the FDA has had a word in the design of and that the FDA has reviewed for validity and, um, and, and efficacy. So I can't make any claims about uh, the clinical application of my drug product um, unless that has been reviewed by the FDA and is based on solid science. Related to that, um, a drug manufacturer is not allowed to say, hey, my drug is approved for major depression, but it's also great for skin picking disorder. Um, so you can't, you can't make any off-label claims uh, because it comes back to rule number one, every claim of drug effect has to be backed up by a lot of science. This is in contrast to, drug, to, to, to lab test vendors. So if I, if I design a genetic test um, and I want to get FDA approval for the test, what the FDA signs off on is if I claim that my test measures gene X or five variants of gene X, then the science behind that and my laboratory procedures are such that if I say gene X genotype is so-and-so, that that's what it is in reality. So, so the, the approval is for the validity of the test to measure what I claim it's measuring. That's all. Uh, there's actually will this kind of, uh, I view it as a loophole in the promotional language. Beyond my test measuring what I claim it's measuring, I have no other, I have no other um, regulatory binds. So I can, I'm free to say what Ever I want to say about, and if you get this test and this result is A, then that will mean X, Y, and Z. I can make all sorts of claims about uh, applications of my test with no review whatsoever. Um, the only thing that actually restrains the claims that I can make is whether it's believable in the marketplace. Um, and what I, part of what has inspired me to create this slide set is that I know of lots of physicians from all over the country who are getting visited by representatives of, of these laboratory testing companies. I know of Medicaid and Medicare offices that are getting visited by these representatives. And today we hear about the Amish church fund getting visited by some salesperson, making all sorts of claims, no doubt, about this is going to save you money, this is going to get the right test, this is going to blah, blah, blah. Uh, again, those are backed up by the science that they, the companies themselves, largely fund. Um, there, is no, there is no objective, disinterested third party that's putting a break on these claims. Uh, so what are these claims specifically? Um, the, 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 the products that are available say that they will detect genetic variants of uh, receptor of, of receptor proteins and predominantly enzymes that metabolize drugs. This is not controversial. This is what the test does. Um, the, the claims are made that if a person is a carrier of a certain genotype, that uh, of, of a certain genotype of drug metabolism enzymes, this will help the clinician to predict higher or lower drug levels. This is partially true. Um, genes are related to drug levels to greater or lesser extents. It depends largely on which drug we're talking about. And as I'll say later on, the level of a drug in the blood is related partly to the genetic profile of the drug metabolizing enzymes, but also to things like age, gender, ethnicity, diet, smoking, and other medications. So it becomes really hard to say that if I know a genotype, I can reliably predict the, the right dose or the or predict a drug concentration from that. Uh, the claims are made that with pharmacogenetically in, informed 
uh, decision making that patients will get the right medicine the first time, um, that they will have a shorter time to wellness, um, better results. And this is, uh, you know, many, many salespeople actually spend this deliberately and untruthfully as it'll give you the right diagnosis. Um, these claims, as we'll see, are based upon a limited and fairly weak evidence, uh, which are, um, largely influenced by a lot of bias confounds which, uh, which are problematic in my view. So um, to restate, the, the, the popularity of pharmacogenetic testing actually are three things. Um, two things is this is FDA approved. So it rides on the image of FDA approval. Um, we're used to that for drugs. Um, and we, you know, the, the, the clinician or the patient um, thinks that uh, the FDA approval means a lot more for a laboratory test than it, than it actually really does. Um, the, the, the gene test manufacturers can point to the unarguable and spectacular success of pharmacogenomic testing for drugs whose concentrations really matter, like Coumadin or Jijoxin. Uh, knowing that a person is the poor metabolizer or rapid metabolizer of Coumadin, for example, will reduce the errors in initial dosing, and that translates into very clinically meaningful results. Um, and the, the, the third thing uh, that, that on which the popularity of pharmacogenetic testing rests is that uh, we all know that genes are powerful. Uh, the general public and the general doctor understands that genes are important. Um, unfortunately as well, the general public and the general doctor don't have really the best detailed understanding of the role of, of, the role of genes. So when you see something that's very important and you uh, are very powerful and you don't understand it, um, the, some people argue that, that that results in people worshiping it. Uh, it, it things are accepted without a lot of criticism um, and, uh, and so forth. So let's look at some of the actual specific problems or weaknesses in these um, sales pitches. Uh, first, um, knowing the gene uh, profile of drug metabolizing enzymes will help you to um, avoid too high or too low uh, drug concentrations. This runs into what I call the dose occupancy problem. Uh, for a lot of drugs, we can actually look at um, the ability of the drug to bind to the target proteins in the brain. Here is a dose occupancy curve for uh, sertraline, Zoloft, um, versus the percent of serotonin transport proteins in the brain that are bound to that drug. Uh, you'll see on the, the panel on the left that uh, you get this hyperbolic curve with an asymptote toward the top. Notice the, the oral dosing. Um, standard oral dose of 50, uh, sertraline is 50 milligrams. At 50 milligrams, you're at 80% occupancy of the target protein. At 100 milligrams, you're also at 80%. Um, so there's very little change. You're, you're at a plateau with the starting dose. 20% lower level or 20% higher level is going to result in between 75% occupancy to 85% occupancy. Is this really a big deal? Um, here's another set of curves from the same paper by Meyer et al. in American Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, this is even more impressive. This is for fluoxetine or Prozac. Um, at 2.7 milligrams oral dose, you're occupying 50% of the serotonin transport proteins in the brain. At the, sta at the starting approved dose, 20 milligrams, you're at the 80% mark, and you stay at 80% across the dosing range. So again, 20% variation in level is going to translate into maybe 5% uh, variation in, um, in binding to the target. Uh, whether that's an important clinical, clinically significant distinction is, is debatable. Uh, it's also very impressive. Here's the dose occupancy curve for venlafaxine on the serotonin transporter. Uh, note that it takes just under six milligrams dose of venlafaxine to get to 50% uh, of maximal occupancy. And at the starting dose of 75 milligrams per day, you are at the plateau of this curve. So again, small variations uh, and, and most of the generic vari variations will account for 20 to 30% deviation from the mean. Um, and you have, you know, um, very small deviations in occupancy targets. Uh, then we have also the problem of does drug level, to what extent does drug level actually predict therapeutic response? And to what degree does drug level predict adverse effect? Well, for therapeutic response with the modern antidepressants, um, uh, there is no relationship between blood level and therapeutic response. 
Uh, this is often, in, in some critics, we'll see this as a um, as sort of a fatal wound to the notion that these drugs are actually effective. Um, I assert that the reason we don't see dose response relationships is because at starting doses, these are already maximally dosed. So, um, so whether you have a 20% up or down in the drug level in the blood, probably has no bearing on the therapeutic likelihood of the likelihood of a therapeutic response. Um, what about the claim that um, higher or lower drug levels predicted by these genes will um, predict better or worse uh, tolerance? There's actually very few studies that, that address that systematically. So it might be the case, but um, there's very little debit, you know, to, to point to drug levels, uh, very little study on that particular question. Then we have what I call the clinical studies problem. So um, I will cite Assure, that's the makers of GeneSight because I've known, I, I've heard many of their claims more often having worked in Cincinnati, which is in which they're, they're based. Um, Assurex will cite studies that they, that, they, that, they have, that have been performed that they actually have funded. If you read the fine print, Assurex has funded every study that they point to for making efficacy claims. The actual effect sizes um, of money saved or therapeutic response or percent improvement in Hamilton depression score are actually relatively small. And none of these studies, none of these studies that I have ever seen has adequately controlled for expectation effect. Um, placebo responding based upon, now I have a gene test. I should be, this is the best medicine for me and therefore I'm going to respond. Um, that, that is another way of stating what I call the blinding problem. Um, if I'm if I'm a if I'm a physician in the study and I get a report, or if I don't get a report, if I'm quote unquote blind, but I'm told change the medicine, oh, I'm changing the medicine because the gene says I should change it. Um, so the clinician has the clinician is not blinded, the patient is not blinded. Uh, either they get the report or they see a med change, but the study protocol says you will get medicine change if the gene says you should change. So you're not blinded. Um, interestingly, Assurex only says that their product will help to guide decision-making for antidepressant or, or SSRI-like anxiolytic medications. These happen to be the conditions which are most susceptible to placebo responding. Um, the only way that you can really do this kind of test that controls for expectation bias is to be deceptive. And IRBs these days are massively against deliberate deception. So the way you have to do the study to get the result, to get to get interpretable results, is you have to give some. You have to get a genotype for some patient, then you have to give them the wrong choice. You have to give them the, the red box medicine and say this is the med. You have to lie then and say this is the medicine that genes have predicted is best for you, um, but in reality is not. And then test the outcomes in that in that paradigm. Nobody has done that yet, and probably they can't do that because of the ethical concerns. So the, the blinding problem is enormous. Um, and I think actually, I, I have yet to be convinced personally that any claimed benefit is explained by anything other than expectation bias um, in, 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 in people who are now being told, this is what your genes have dictated. We've gone to the temple of genetics, and this is what the high priest has told you. Um, so... And, and what about the, and we have the metabolism problem. So the claim of the, of the gene companies is that if I know that I'm a poor metabolizer or a fast metabolizer, that will somehow relate to meaningful, clinically meaningful changes in my drug levels. Um, but if I, know, if I know exactly my genotype for 2D6, and if I take Prozac, which is a 2D6 metabolized medicine, I have no idea what my Prozac concentration is going to be. Um, and because, you know, how does that compare? I mean, because gender, age, smoking status, other illnesses, other medications have in sometimes greater ability to skew drug, drug, drug levels in the blood than a, gene, than a gene would predict. So it gives you very little predictive ability. Um, and by the way, for drugs whose love, for, psycho, for psychotropic drugs whose blood level actually does matter, carbamazepine, clozapine, phenytoin, and tricyclics, you can find any lab in any city that you'll get your result in a day. So why get a gene test for one or two thousand dollars 
wait a week and then have this marginally predictable result when I can send my person down to Quest or LabCorp and I can get, I can know this dose of amitriptyline is producing this level of amitriptyline and nortriptyline in the blood and that is associated with this likelihood of therapeutic response or side effect. So for the drugs whose concentrations matter, we can know these concentrations quickly. Um, for the drugs whose concentrations don't matter, like venlafaxine, fluoxetine, duloxetine, et cetera, there's no point in testing in testing the in testing the, uh, the, the 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 drug levels. So I, I it fails to impress me um, that argument that they make. Um, and then we have what I call the secrecy problem. So Assurex will you know you'll send the genes in, um, and I just I can't resist. You'll, you'll pay some thousand to two thousand dollars by the way i can then see on tv i can get a cheek swab and send it into one of these companies and get it for like 49 dollars or 90 dollars my entire genome um so for you know for a thousand dollars i can send it to assurex and they will get me a report which is generated on a secret internal algorithm so i get a green box a yellow box and a red box you know they assign that based upon their black box uh, behind the scene thing um, which, you know, is, is a business model, but how is that going to be subjected to, uh, to, to validation or rejection by external investigators? So, so we don't know exactly what they're doing. Uh, therefore, it's not amenable to, uh, you know, um, critical reappraisal in the scientific community. Um, and then we have what I call, I call it the red boxing problem. I just made up that word. Um, so uh, I don't know if other companies do this, but I know that Assurex slash GeneSight does this. Um, you'll send your cheek swab into the lab. They'll send you a report, which is color coded, green, yellow, and red. Um, use normally, use with caution, and so forth. Um, again, I come back to genetic testing is popular because we know that genes are important, but we understand very, we, most people don't understand them very well. It's, therefore, it's a very powerful thing um, in the mind and can very much easily sway um, placebo responding. Um, so you get this box, you get this, you get this, you know, you get, you get this visual image, green, red. Red is like, oh my, red is the emergency color, right? So on a psychological level, it impresses both the doctor and the patient in my experience of consulting with people. Um, you know, I consult with physicians and patients alike. And um, of course, I see people that have, that have not gotten better with prior tiers of treatment. So my view of the world is a bit skewed. But from my vision of the world, a lot of physicians and a lot of patients just don't get it. The red box is bad. Um, and there are, there, are, there are reports in literature, for example, a lady with schizophrenia or, uh, or a persistent psychotic illness had failed multiple antipsychotic medications and had had one of these tests and clozapine was in the red box. And so this person, you know, it was suggested you should be on clozapine um, no, 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 that's a red box medicine. And ultimately, at a get another hospitalization and with enough of the right kind of coaching, uh, the patient was persuaded to give clozapine a try, and lo and behold, psychosis resolved. So, how many hospitalizations and how much suffering uh, was caused by the fact that I can't be on this because of the red box? In my own experience, I had a guy um, who had a lot of obsessive tendencies and a lot of, um, you know, a, a little bit of psychotic overlay on that. And I suggested one day in the midst of a crisis that he should take an antipsychotic medication. The one I chose, I chose because it is reasonably well tolerated and has low, low likelihood of metabolic side effect risk. Um, he kind of shrieked at me and scolded me for not having read his genetics report. And how dare I suggest that medicine? That's a red medicine for him. This individual, unfortunately, would only accept medicines which were in his green box, and those medicines were all the worst medicines for weight gain liability, and uh, he, gained, he promptly gained 20 pounds. I'm not joking. In four weeks, um, it, was, it was a horrible uh, you know, uh, adverse response, uh, but I was kind of boxed in myself because um, I had to treat the psychosis, and he would only accept the ones that, that the genetic company told him would work. Uh, so there are, I mean, there, there's no shortage of that. There are also examples, at least in clinical practice among my colleagues of, um, uh, of patients or physicians getting this report. Oh my gosh, you're on this medicine and it's the wrong medicine for you. So we'll change it. And you, you stop a perfectly effective medicine and get somebody onto one that's less effective. Um, and so the, the, the adverse risks of red boxing um are, are not highlighted in the, in the reports. So to summarize, um, 
I personally think that to the extent the literature suggests that there's benefit, this can be easily accounted for by placebo responding and placebo responding, specifically the expectation effect of the genes have declared this and therefore you're good, has not been controlled in any study I've read. Um, further, how much more advantage do you get from gene testing? What you should do, what everybody should do, who wants to dare to prescribe psychotropic medications to people is choose a medicine with the best evidence for the condition, start it at the lowest dose, watch carefully for the evolution of therapeutic benefit or side effects and adjust the dose frequent, uh, adjust the dose gradually. If you do this, you will eliminate a whole bunch of problems that the gene companies say that they, they are, that, that they claim to solve. Um, so I don't see it as a replacement for good clinical practice. Um, period. And this, this red box effect of I'm going to avoid a medicine simply because the blind black box algorithm at Assurex says it's a bad one for me. Of course, Assurex doesn't say it's a bad medicine for you, but the fact that it's in a red box and used with caution um, is interpreted by many people as that is a bad medicine for me, um, you know, does have the potential to cause, uh, to cause harm uh, through several mechanisms as I've described. So um, those are my thoughts on the pharmacogenetic testing. Uh,